Hello everybody and welcome to Church at Home with Rachel for Tuesday the 20th of February. Um, as I've mentioned before, I'm trying to work through some uh, some parts I highlighted from this book by John Shelby Spong, Jesus for the Non-Religious, before I hand it over to a parishioner um, as I prepare to leave Wainwright. So you're going to hear probably quite a bit of this book this week, maybe even next. So this um, he, in this part, he's talking about miracles, nature miracles, interpretive signs, not historical events. That's the name of the, the chapter that I'm reading here. And I'm going to share something with you and just talk about miracles a little bit. And Because the fact is, I'm just not sure. And I'm okay with saying that I'm just not sure. There's the part of me that is the believer and the, the wanting to believe in miracles. And the part of me that says, you know, Maybe they aren't so much. So I'm going to share this with you and just chat and feel free to disagree with me. And if you don't like the video, it's okay to give me a thumbs down. Um, but think about it if you do give me a thumbs down about whether it's because you don't like the topic or you really think I'm nuts. Either way, it doesn't matter to me. I'm totally okay with that. But here we go. He says here on, on page 69, he says, If miracles are a late developing part of the Jesus story, then they, like so much else that we are discovering, may also be an expression, not of supernaturalism, but of the inadequacy of human language to be a vehicle for making rational sense out of an ultimate God experience. What we need to realize is that only a God language could be used to talk meaningfully about God, and we do not have a God language. Without a God language, human beings can talk about God only by heightening human events until they become supernatural realities similar to what we expect God and God's actions to be. There's so much in there. But the part about the God language, it's like when I'm trying to explain, uh, I have a friend who, who does not believe he's colorblind, but from everything he ever says to me about the color of my eyes or what I'm wearing or other things, color of vehicles, I swear to God, he's colorblind. And so in trying to explain to, to this person the differences between what he is seeing or saying he's seeing what I'm seeing and, and believing, of course, if I think that I'm right, um, that, that, that I am correct and he is incorrect, trying to explain the differences, the subtleties. And it sometimes I just go so frustrated because we have no common language to share. I say green, he says blue. I say something might be um, a fuchsia color and he thinks it's something else or doesn't understand what that means. We're speaking on two different levels. We, do, we don't have a common language in between. So he's up here and I'm over here, or better yet, say he's over here, I'm over here. And what we need is some kind of common language in here. And I think the part that that from Spong that really speaks to me here isn't the sort of the questions about miracles, although I'll get into that in a minute. It's more about the language that we are trying to understand and and grapple with a concept of God through Jesus for which we don't have a real language. We cannot speak God's language. We don't know what it is. We may from time to time get sort of ideas or senses about it, but we can't, we can't articulate it. We can't put our finger on it. We can't clearly and articulately state what God is. Some people will argue with me that they know exactly what God is. And I would argue that then there's no arguing with you. <laughs> I'm not going to try. I recognize that I am not God. And as I am not God, I have not got the privilege of being able to speak the God language. The God language, I think, is what spoke into being creation, the Big Bang, the Earth being formed from, from, from stars that have burnt up, however we want to think about that. I don't have the ability, the capacity, the knowledge to speak the God language. I think it's just the God language is just so much more powerful and intense and creative that I don't have that ability. But that means that how I think about God and how I think about Jesus as the Son of God and as an and as the manifestation, the incarnation of God on earth, I don't have a language that fully describes that. And so this idea that of the God that without a God language, human beings can talk about God only by heightening human events 
until it becomes supernatural realities similar to what we expect God and God's actions to be. Again, right there, we are so dis like so not God that we don't even know what God's actions would be. We can only imagine them in our mind. It's kind of like when I was a kid, I only knew a certain area. I only knew a certain part of the world. And I remember when we flew to Florida from, we lived in St. Thomas, we we went to Toronto, we got on a train, we, or a plane, and we flew, to, we flew to Florida. And all of a sudden, my worldview got bigger. Before that, I could not even imagine what Disney World looked like. I could not imagine what orange trees, the orange grove would look like. I could not imagine what it was like to live, to be in a place where in March you could wear shorts and sandals when I was used to having to wear snow pants and snow boots and scarves and mitts and hats and all of these things. Until I turned nine, eight or nine years old and, and flew to another part of this continent, my worldview was smaller. And then flying to this new land widened my horizons. I was able to imagine new things and it took a whole new meaning reading some of the Judy Bloom books that take place in Florida to have some sense of what Florida looked like. My understanding of Jesus and what Jesus did and who how God works is limited by my ability to imagine, which is limited by my experiences and my, my ability to conceptualize, which means that I don't, anything, that, how, any way that I interpret or understand or believe in Jesus and what Jesus did means that I am having to just ramp up my own ability to understand. And it's never going to come close. So not having this God language means that the way I think about Jesus is ultimately limited by my own ability to think, the words that I use, the imagination that I have. It can never quite get where it is. And he, when he's talking, when John Spong is talking about miracles here, he's talking a great deal about where did they, ever, did they actually happen? And he seems to be positing the idea that the miracles never did actually happen, not the way they were written down. That, you know, Jesus didn't feed 5,000. Um, one of the stories that I have heard, and it makes great sense to me, is that Jesus did not literally take five loaves of bread and 12 fish, or however it went, and turn it into enough food to, f to feed 5,000, that there was actual food. But that what the miracle that Jesus really did was he showed generosity. A child came from among them and said, here you go, Jesus, I have, I have two fish and one loaf of bread. Like, I'm, I know it's not right. I can't remember what it was. But this young child, his mom sent him out the door in the morning and said, here you go. Here's your meal for the day. Go. Be a good boy. And, and any good Jewish mom is going to tell this child, you know, you take care of your neighbor. We take care of each other. So if there's another child sitting beside you when you're out, you know, playing, share your lunch. So Jesus is standing there and says to the disciples, well, they came to him that we have not got a food, enough food. And Jesus says, gather what you have. And this little boy comes up and say, here, you can have what I have. And it isn't, the miracle is not that Jesus changed the, mo the molecules of the fish and the bread so that they multiplied somehow. What Jesus did was the miracle was he opened people's hearts. Think about it. Did those people all really come and follow Jesus without having prepared for their day? Would they really have gotten up in the morning and walked out thinking, oh, I'll just wing it, run over to the closest food truck for lunch? There wasn't such a thing. Chances are all of those people or most of them would have had some morsels of something with them would have brought them with their for their family. And then when Jesus said saw this this child sharing and other people started to share, more and more people shared until when it was everything was over and people had opened up the bounty they brought with them, they found that there there was more than enough. The real miracle isn't that Jesus changed the molecular structure of fish and loaves. The real miracle is that Jesus changed people's hearts. That they discovered that when they were open to one another and caring and loving of one another they actually had more than enough themselves. And when they shared that with the common group, they found that they had more than enough for the whole group. That's the real miracle. Now, there will be some people who will argue that no, absolutely, Jesus did absolutely heal people and he raised people from the dead. But I have to keep thinking, you know, those scriptures, those gospels were written down so long after Jesus died and rose again, that how were they really interpreted? Are they not more allegorical? Are they not more stories about how pe Jesus changed people's lives? I don't know. The, the part of me that is a rational thinking human being says, no, like the whole, 
raising them from the dead and helping them hear again, I think those are those are metaphors that someone who was unable to hear the truth about love and family and hope and joy and peace, Jesus came into their life and spoke to them or loved them or did something that helped them to become open to that. And they were once again able to hear the word of God. They were able to see the work of God before them. Their, the healing was more of their soul than it was physically of their, like the, the unshriveling of, a, of a, leper's, a leper's hand. I don't know, and I'm willing to say I don't know. Does that stop me from praying for miracles in my life? Absolutely not. A year and a half ago when Rob was so sick, I prayed for a miracle in his life. I prayed that his heart would heal. And his heart is now back to almost perfect. And they told us that couldn't happen. Does that mean that a miracle happened? Or maybe modern medicine did its work, did its job. Maybe the miracle is in that scientists and, and people have done the work over the years to discover the beauty and the wonder that can happen when we work together and we try new things and we put together the elements of God's creation in such a way that those medicines can help heal a heart. I still pray for miracles. I pray. I still pray for miracles because it's right back to that original thing I said at the beginning of this video about the God speak. I don't know the mind of God. I haven't even got not one tiny little particle of my brain is is strong enough. Not not sorry, I should say, not one part of my whole brain is strong enough or able enough to interpret one tiny, tiny, tiny little particle of God's brain to understand what it is that God is speaking. What is God doing? What miracles is God performing in our world as we know it when I am incapable of truly understanding the difference between the word, the definition of the word miracle that I have and the definition of the miracle that we would understand if we could speak God's language. Do I believe in miracles? Yes. Do I know what miracles are? No. Do I still pray for miracles that I think of as miracles? Healing of someone's heart, mind, body, soul? Absolutely. Do I pray for miracles that, that people will be saved from a burning house or that you know there might be survivors from, a, from a, a plane that goes down? Or the miracle that a plane that's going down might somehow be landed safely by the pilot? Absolutely, I, I believe and I pray for those miracles. And sometimes they happen and sometimes they don't. But when they don't, it doesn't stop me from believing in miracles or praying for them. It's kind of the conundrum of being a faithful Christian person. I just end up having more questions than I have answers. But isn't that really what life is all about? What I really hope for is that someday I will understand miracles from God's perspective. And that someday, maybe when I come face to face with God, I might have the privilege of speaking God speak, God's language. But right now, all I have is this. And as you know, if you've been following me for a while, <laughs> it's not the greatest all the time, but it is what it is. I try. And I really do think that that's all God asks of us is that we try. So that's my take on miracles and God's language. Have a great day. God bless you. I'll see you again tomorrow for Church at Home with Rachel.